one of the things Donald Trump has talked about is is treaties that the U.S. has been involved in. A TPP is one of them, that Iran deal is another deal that he's talking about trying to get out of. How about the Paris climate deal, which the president, and I believe John Kerry said this week, was you couldn't back out of that. It's a done deal. I think he's trying to say that to convince himself. Uh, we're joined right now by Nick Loris. Uh, Nick, nice enough to uh, join us. He's an economist at the uh, Heritage Foundation. Nick, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let's talk for a moment about this this Paris Climate Agreement and kind of where things stand with it. Yeah, well, so right now we've signed, we're a party to it because of President Obama, the way that he structured the deal. Um, it did not need to be ratified uh, through the Senate. Uh, he used the term what's called a sole executive agreement. And what he's doing is using domestic regulations that will drive up the cost of energy by restricting CO2 emissions, uh, the clean power plant regulations on new power plants, fuel efficiency standards, all of these things um, to restrict energy use in the United States and using that as the means to comply with the Paris Agreement. The, the nice thing about doing it unilaterally, though, is that uh, President-elect Trump could do the same thing by pulling out of the entire framework altogether. So, so when uh, John Kerry announced... I'm pretty sure I read this last week that this was a done deal and there's no way the U.S. could get out of it. Um, he was kind of blowing a little bit of smoke there, I'm guessing. Yeah, he was. And in fact, this uh, we could get out of this thing in a year um, because we are a party to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's what allowed <laughs> President Obama uh, to negotiate Paris without the Senate. And Article 25 of that framework, and this dates back to 1992, uh, says that any party can withdraw from the convention uh, three years after the framework has entered into the force. So that was in 1995 um, by just submitting a, a note uh, to the Secretary General of the United Nations, and that would withdraw the U.S. from any protocol to which it is, is a party, uh, including Paris. So there's a very easy unilateral way out of Paris. Uh, Nick, tell me what. It, let's let's just assume for a moment that. We don't get out of it. Let's talk about the deal as it stands. What are what are the requirements for the U.S. and and what are the risks to the U.S. economy under the confines of this agreement? Yeah, well, this the confines of this agreement are the domestic regulations that are effectively the backdoor cap and trade uh, by regulatory executive fiat that the Obama administration has put in place over the past eight years. Um, his, what's known as intended nationally determined contributions, what you submit to Paris, uh, he announced plans to reduce U.S. carbon dioxide emissions 26 to 28 percent below uh, 2005 levels by the year 2025. And you know, what effectively that amounts to is an energy tax, because most of our energy needs are met through carbon emitting um, conventional fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas, when you cap them and restrict their use, you are going to drive up energy costs on American families and businesses. And those costs ripple throughout the economy because you're not just hit when uh, you go to the gas station or when you pay your electricity bill, but when you go to the grocery store, the Home Depot, because just about everything that we do takes energy to make. And so it has a tremendous negative ripple effect on the economy and for very little if any climate benefit this these regulations are all all economic pain and no real climate benefit so so it's all um, because it these products then are almost going to get hit with this tax uh, at several stages it's almost like a vat tax right i mean it kind of builds up that's right yeah and, and you know the businesses are going to cost these higher or pass these higher costs on to consumers uh, the ones who can absorb the cost that means they're not uh, innovating, they're not expanding and investing, and so it really acts as kind of an economic vice that squeezes both the production and the consumption end of the economy, uh, and it results in you know hundreds of thousands of jobs lost, uh, really hitting our energy-intensive manufacturing sector hard, and also hitting low-income families uh, the hardest who spend a higher percentage of their budget on energy bills, and so th this has you know virtually all downside. Yeah, that yeah, that's true. And um I mean, I 
it's one of the reasons that I was encouraging people to vote in this election and to vote against Hillary Clinton, because I, I knew that a vote for her would be a continuation of policies like this, not to mention her stated uh, desire to basically run coal companies out of business, which this president's done a pretty good job moving toward that uh, t- to begin with. But it's, it's you know, at least t- on the bright side, Donald Trump can get in office 60 days from now, and within 12 months, we can be done with this climate Paris, Paris Climate Accord, right? Yeah, and that's just the first step. And this whole keep it in the ground movement from the environmental activist base has thwarted, you know, you know, tens of thousands of jobs from being created and new energy sources from coming online. If you look mm-hmm. at Keystone XL, which is just one infrastructure project, but uh, you know, temporarily could have created thousands of jobs. Uh, President Obama's own State Department said that it wouldn't contribute significantly to climate change. Yet they decided to uh, reject the permit application. So all of these decisions that were made at the executive level um, that were not based in sound science or technical environmental reviews, but were done for political purposes, can now be reversed and we can move forward and build on the success that the private sector has developed when it comes to energy, uh, especially on state and privately owned lands that have done tremendous amount of uh, economic benefits for uh, Americans you know, all over the country. We, we can build off that success by creating more policies that allow for the market to thrive. Excellent point. Nick Loris with the Heritage Foundation, thanks for your time. You bet. Thanks for have, having me. Have, have a great day. Uh, did you see that the uh, protests continue on this uh, North Dakota pipeline? Uh, and the crowd showed up the other night and decided they were going to still obstruct somehow. So they turned, apparently, they turned a water hose on at them. But they didn't spray them with the water. They sprayed it up into the air. And it was so cold that they were trying to freeze them out, basically. And then the complaint was that some of them had to be treated for hypothermia. I'm sorry. Didn't you choose to be there uh, at a private construction site, which you're trying to disrupt? I don't feel an ounce of sorrow for these folks. This thing went through hundreds of regulatory approvals to get permission to be put in and there are hundreds of other pipelines just like it already in the ground all around this one but this is where they've chosen to make their stand it's just ridiculous is what it is um all right let me